Great, thanks so much. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Adam, I'm a second year IAM resident, and today I'm gonna to talk about uh, the gamma get. So just a brief outline. Uh, we're gonna go through a patient case that we'll take throughout the kind of the duration of the um, talk uh, as we learn more about the patient. Uh, and then we're gonna go through some basics of uh, you know functions of globulins, SPIP, and then towards the end, we'll chat a little bit about monoclonal gametophytes like uh, NGUS and multiple linear moment that I think uh, you guys are expecting. So here's just a patient case that I uh, patient that I, I saw in the on cardiology I think a couple of weeks ago. So this is a, a lady with HFREF, a CAD, and AFib. She came in initially for shortness of breath, and so her relevant history was uh, she's from American Samoa and she's visiting family. Just finished um, a pretty long like twenty hour flight uh, to Hawaii and then to uh, Seattle. Uh, she's gotten a little bit more. Um, uh, dysmic, uh, she has some swollen legs, and then review of systems is positive for some dizziness, vomiting that she attributes to motion sickness, um, and orthopnea. In the ED, uh, she's pretty tachycardic, uh, blood pressure is 120 over 100, respiratory rate 28, and breathing well on room air. She's given some Lasix um, and some metoprolol, and then afterwards her heart rate improves a little bit. Um, this is kind of the sign out you get from the ED. And then um, as you're checking her labs, these are her labs. So she has a sodium of 124, creatinine um, of 3.3, uh, bile of two and protein of 9.9. .9. So uh, just to see if the polls are working, uh, what labs are you concerned about in, in this patient? And then hopefully throughout the rest of the session, we'll have some interactive polls as well. Polls should be launched. Let me know if you're not seeing them. And for this one, we can be relatively quick. It's just kind of a basic uh, practice and giving it away. Let's see. Okay, great. Uh, so some of you are concerned about the sodium, uh, obviously, because this talk is about the gamma gap, you should be concerned about the protein, uh, which is E, uh, even though, you know, I would be concerned about the creatinine and sodium too. Uh, a lot of you guys put down that. Um, so why should you be concerned about the protein? Well, just to give you some um, background, uh, you know, protein uh, comes from the plasma component of blood. Uh, when you separate out blood, about half of it, a little under the half is, is your red blood cells and a little bit more than half is your plasma. Uh, in the plasma component, 7% of it uh, consists of protein. And there's a couple of major subtypes, you know, majority of your protein uh, comes from albumin. It composes 60% of the protein. And then 35% of it is uh, globulin, and then there's a small amount uh, consisting of fibrinogen and various other um, proteins like anti alpha-1 antitrypsin. Um, when the protein, when is the protein abnormal? So uh, this is a this is a formula that, that you can quickly calculate in your head uh, to determine the gamma gap or the protein gap. And so it's a fairly simple calculation of protein minus the albumin and the, the calculation should give you the remaining globulin proportion. And so in most uh, patients, uh, anything more than four is an abnormal gamma gap. In our case, for the patient that we had uh, seen, her total protein was 9.9 .9 and her albumin was 4.3. And so her gap was abnormal. Another way of thinking about this is to calculate a albumin to globulin ratio um, or an AG ratio. Basically, it's albumin divided by your gamma gap, which we just calculated. And because of the components of your protein, majority of it should be albumin and uh, your globulin component should never be more than your albumin component. That's why it's greater than one. And so in our case, um, it's again, abnormal at 0.7. Now, why do we care? So um, I found this pretty interesting. So there's a research article uh, published a couple of years ago uh, looking at all-cause mortality and the gamma gap. And so this is a study looking at a pretty decent population size, uh, U.S. patients, uh, mostly healthy, greater than uh, 20 years old. And basically, it's a cross-sectional observational study where patients had 
annual uh, checkups and labs conducted um, just to look at what uh, factors contribute to mortality. And interestingly, one of the main independent risk factors was the gamma gap as a predictor of all-cause mortality. And so this was significant even after, uh, after factoring out other confounding factors like age, underlying health conditions like hypertension, diabetes, um, hepatitis C status. Um, and they found that even at a cutoff of 3.1, uh, the gamma gap is significantly associated with mortality. So for example, this is a Kaplan-Meier curve on the y-axis uh, total mortality uh, or cumulative incidence of mortality. Uh, x-axis is the gamma gap separated into quartiles. And at the highest quartile in here, they just uh, divided by 25%. So the cutoff here was 3.3. Even at 3.3, um, you can see a significant trend for um, significance. Another way of looking at it is that the hazard ratio of dying uh, with a higher gamma gap is significantly increased up to uh, twice as much with a gamma gap of greater than four. And so for the majority of the talk, we're going to look at why this is the case and uh, to assess for different uh, pathologies that are associated with the abnormal gamma gap. Now, um, another uh, par uh, participant interaction, um, you know, there's a many causes of an abnormal gamma gap and in your chat, can you guys just type in uh, some things that come to mind? So we can think of um, an abnormal gamma gap as an overproduction of globulins or an underproduction of albumin. So uh, it's a pretty simple calculation of protein minus the albumin. So um, why don't you guys take a few seconds and just uh, type away in the chat box. MM, great. So NM would fall under the overproduction of globulins. HIV, Hep C, Hep B, yep. So chronic infection can cause an increase in globulins. Waldenstrom's, exactly. How about on the other side, the underproduction of albumin? POM syndrome, exactly. That's a pretty uh, rare condition. Uh, yeah, cirrhosis, nephrotic syndrome, liver disease, all of those cause an underproduction of albumin. Great, thank you for participating. Uh, other things uh, like uh, protein losing enteropathies and burns um, basically a, as a result of third spacing causes uh, significant underproduction of albumin. Um, so for overproduction of globulins, there's many cases and uh, many causes. And so we're going to go through a lot of those during this talk. And so you can see that for our patient, uh, she has a very elevated protein, but her albumin is normal. And so she falls under this category of overproduction of globulins. So uh, now that you know that the gamma gap is abnormal, what do you do next? Well, one thing that you can do is uh, an SPEP. So I'm sure many of you guys have ordered an SPEP before. And just to review what an SPEP actually is, it's basically separation of proteins based on size and charge. So you can see that um, if you remember to your uh, biochemistry days, you can have a gel that you put samples into the gel, and then you have a current and a buffer that separates um, protein. So the, on the left side is a positive charge, right side is a negative charge, and most proteins are negatively charged, so things will flow to the left. You can stain uh, these gels and get a um, separation pattern of your proteins, and um, you have an output that looks something like this. So this is a normal SPEP on the left where the positive charge is up here. The top band is the most negatively charged protein, um, is, which is albumin, and it's also the most predominant. Uh, so 60% of your protein is albumin. The rest of the uh, lane is your globulin uh, proportion. So these, uh, this composes the rest of the 40% of your protein uh, proteins, and you can see that it can separate into different bands. When you have a monoclonal component, um, you can see that it lights up as a singular uh, band uh, that is pretty uh, apparent. And so in the laboratory, um, laboratory uh, section, uh, you can have, uh, you can do this in a high throughput um, way to have, you know, a lot of patient samples. All right. So, uh, most of you guys probably won't see these banding patterns, but you'll see it is a densitometry uh, for quantification. So basically a computer reads the um, density of these bands and it gives you an output in like a curve. And then again, if you have a monoclonal component, you have a spike and we call this an end spike or a, a monoclonal spike. Um, 
just to remind you guys, um, there's many different types of globulins. And um, initially, kind of historically, because we saw these patterns of bands at this section, this section, this section, this section, they kind of group them into different um, subcomponents. We can call these alpha-1, alpha-2, beta, and gamma. But I want to remind you that globulins have a, new, a number of functions. I think when I think of globulins, I think of immunoglobulins. I think of IgA, IgM, IgG, especially in the context of a monoclonal spike. You know, for the M spike, you usually see a, um, a big peak on the right side of your SPEP, um, corresponding to like diseases like MGUS or multiple myeloma. But there's a number of proteins in the plasma. It's not just immunoglobulins. You have things like HDL, alpha-1 antitrypsin. All of these contribute to the different other parts of your uh, SPEP. Uh, things like haptoglobin fall into the alpha-2 component. And then um, you can have things like transferrin and beta lipoprotein in the beta component. And so I think uh, this is a good reminder of just the diversity of globulins in the, in the plasma and how the, uh, deficiencies or overabundance of these proteins can, tribute, can contribute to disease. So as a couple of uh, representative examples, so here you can see an M spike in the lower portion right here, another M spike right here. And then similarly, this is probably corresponding to the beta 2 region. And all of the red boxes are corresponding to overproduction of albumin. And I'm oh, sorry, overproduction of globulin. And then in the blue, uh, you can see that this band is lighter. And so this is an example of underproduction of albumin. So great. Um, now that we have this information, uh, let's try to diagnose this patient. So this is a representative SPEP gel uh, obtained from a laboratory setting. Control uh, Lane number one is our controls uh, lane. And then lane number two is going to be the lane of interest where I want to uh, have you guys try to chime in and diagnose uh, this patient. So, so just based on this gel alone, what do you think is going on for this patient? And to remind you, on the bottom right is um, our distribution of our various globulins. So either hepatitis C infection, multiple myeloma, alpha-1 antitrypsin, hemolytic anemia, or chronic inflammation. And as you do go through that, I'll go through the chat really quick. Okay, there's some questions about nephrotic syndrome. I'll touch upon that in just a little bit. And then questions about uh, why size. So basically when you have a gel uh, and gel electrophoresis, there's a matrix within the gel and you can change the size of the matrix and the size of the pores. And basically the bigger the protein is, the longer it'll take for a protein to migrate through the pores in your gel. And you can choose like different concentrations uh, for your gel. All right, let's take a look at the answers. Great, so most of you guys picked alpha-1 antitrypsin, and that is correct. So just to walk you guys through this, um, the different, oops, uh, the different bands, again, correspond to the different bumps on your SPEP. So the top band is uh, your albumin band. The second band, you can see there's a hypodensity. And so this corresponds to the alpha-1 component. And so uh, diseases that are associated with deficiencies in the alpha-1 component include like H low HDL, low alpha-1 antitrypsin, et cetera. So in this patient, this, uh, this person was diagnosed with severe alpha-1 antitrypsin, antitrypsin deficiency. Um, the other uh, choices, so multiple myeloma, you would expect a singular M spike, but it would be in the immunoglobulin region, so in the gamma portion. For hemolytic anemia, you would expect a um, decrease in haptoglobin, so that would be the alpha-2 component, so that would be the next band. Uh, and then chronic inflammation and, a cron and HCV infection we'll talk about later. So uh, now, now that you guys are warmed up a little bit, uh, here's another um, example. So again, lane one is... Um, our control, and then the red box is the one of interest. What is the diagnosis? And so we can have SCID, multiple myeloma, CLL, nephrotic syndrome, B or C, or all of the above. Uh, 
And this one is a little bit trickier. All right, why don't we close the poll? So this is a pretty tricky one. So most of you guys answered a skit. So skit can definitely be a cause. Of, so what, uh, what we see here is uh, hypogammaglobulinemia. Skit is a classic example of one of the causes of hypogammaglobulinemia. Um, but actually, this is the answer for this is all of the above. So all of these conditions can cause hypogamma globinemia. Uh, that's a mouthful. So B and C in late stages of both multiple myeloma and CLL, you can have complications of reduced gamma globulinemia. And then uh, as someone alluded to earlier on, in nephrotic uh, syndrome, you have loss of uh, most proteins through the urine. So you can have uh, lower uh, gamma globulins as well. So the answer for this is actually all of the above. Other causes of hypogammaglobulinemia include primary amyloidosis and uh, various types of lymphoma as uh, complications in later stages. And for our last example, uh, we have lane number 23. And uh, for this one, the answer choices can be either a monoclonal gammopathy, hepatic cirrhosis, chronic infection, IgE deficiency, B or C, or all of the above. Yeah, Anna, uh, that's a great point. The albumin, albumin band will also be uh, a little bit smaller in nephrotic syndrome as well. That's a good catch. Can we uh, open up the poll? One second, I just have to clear the answers on the old one. Hold on. <laughs> no worries, no worries, sorry. Here we go, no problem. Oh, ah, oops, I ended it. Hold on, sorry. <laughs> ah, I'm still getting the hang of this, you guys. Okay, hopefully you see it now. Still got a few folks answering. We're at about half of people. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and end this. There we go. All right, so this one looks like it was pretty tricky. So a lot of you guys answered A, monoclonal gammopathy. That's actually not what's going on here. So if you compare lanes 23 and 27, 27 is an example where there's a monoclonal gammopathy, where there's a clear differentiated peak or a clear band. Uh, what's going on here in lane 23, this is actually a polyclonal gammopathy in which there is a diversity of uh, globulin components. And so this can happen in a variety of conditions, but most of these include chronic inflammation. Um, so the answer for this is actually B and C. So I think chronic infection, this kind of makes sense. If you have um, chronic infection, you have production of diversity of various immunoglobulins uh, consisting of like IgM, IgG, et cetera. And then hepatic cirrhosis, you have chronic inflammation uh, an expression of various cytokines that can cause 
your B cells to express um, uh, immunoglobulins apparently. Other causes of uh, polyclonal uh, hypergammaglobulinemia include IBD, granulomas, and various autoimmune conditions. So I think the key takeaway from this is that uh, chronic inflammation can cause polyclonal gammopathies. And so sometimes if you run an SPEP uh, in, on an inpatient study, you might see something like this, uh, where you have a protein gap. Uh, this is 8.9 minus 4.5, so a gamma gap of 4.4. And then the gamma component um, is abnormal, but then you see something like this. You have a polyclonal hypergammaglobulinemia, and this suggests a reactive or inflammatory process. And usually in the inpatient setting, when you get this, it resolves after the acute illness has gone down. Now, um, kind of thank you guys for participating in the last three examples. I think the main takeaway that I want, wanted you guys to have is not necessarily diagnosing uh, patient diseases based on SPES, but basically that S patterns can tell you a lot about the underlying condition. So we didn't go through all of these, but depending on the pattern of elevation in the alpha one, alpha two, beta, gamma uh, components, you can have a lot of diseases that are associated. Um, so for the rest of this talk, we're going to focus on probably what we most associate with an abnormal SPEP, which is uh, MGUS and multiple myeloma and other monoclonal gammopathies. So going back to our patient case, um, our patient ended up getting a SPEP, and we see that the gamma co component is abnormal. Uh, it's a 3.2, and there's a, a clonality, monoclonality. And so just to remind you, an SPEP would look something like this. But all of these examples uh, shown here in red, they can indicate a monoclonal component. But um, these are all di different diseases. So how do we distinguish what, what is what? Um, so, you know, there's a lot of different causes. You can, you can have Waldenstrom's, AL amyloidosis, POM syndrome. I think all of you guys mentioned this previously. So the next step after you get an SPEP and there's a monoclonal component is to get a uh, uh, serum Im immunofixation. So just to remind you about the structure of immun immunoglobulins, there's a couple of components. So immunoglobulins all have a heavy chain, which is shown in blue. The heavy chain defines the immunoglobulin class. So it tells you whether it's IgA, IgG, IgD, IgM. And then attached to the heavy chain is a light chain shown in orange and red. This is a smaller proportion that um, can be expressed along with their immunoglobulin, but also with uh, kappa, or also individually as kappa or lambda dimers. So for example, uh, if they're individual, they're called kappa monomers, and if they're uh, bound together with a disulfide bond, it's called lambda. So light chains are um, uh, often produced in excess, uh, up to 40%, and this is totally normal. Uh, there's really no functional difference between lambda or kappa chains, and a normal lambda, uh, kappa to lambda ratio is 0.2 to 1.65. So how does immun serum immunofixation help us? Uh, basically, this is, a, uh, this is a laboratory tool in which you have different lanes that have different anti-sera against the different immunoglobulin components. So for example, in this first lane, you have anti-IgG anti-sera and IgA in the second and et cetera. And then you can separate it by heavy and light chain. So there's separate, uh, separate lanes for kappa uh, light chain and lambda light chain. And the important thing to note is that for a monoclonal gammopathy, the size of this band remains the same in all of the lanes for your serum immun immunofixation. So this, uh, this uh, basically the results of this study show that our monoclonal component is an IgG lambda monoclonal gammopathy. Serum immunofixation is very useful for monitoring disease progression in patients with monoclonal gammopathy. So we often use a free light chain involved to uninvolved ratio to monitor changes in disease. So in this case, the involved light chain is the lambda component and the uninvolved um, light chain is the kappa. And so if you take this ratio, it should be quite high. So this is maybe, if this is like 20 and this is like 0.5, it would be a ratio of like 40 or something. And so as you progress in disease, it can uh, either increase or decrease. 
So some other, uh, so here's another uh, multiple choice question. And here it's asking you to identify what kind of gammopathy is present. Um, so here's a gel for a serum immunofixation and here are a couple of different choices. And then while you guys are working on that, let me just review the chat really, really quick. <laughs> Thanks, Lily. Lily, we love it. All right, what do we think? Yeah, great. Uh, looks like most of you guys got this. So the correct answer for this is G. And so what's going on here is that this is actually a biclonal gammopathy. So you don't necessarily have to have monoclonal gammopathy. So you can have two separate um, types of uh, Ig expressed. So here we have an IgM kappa component and the IgG lambda component. And so the correct answer for this is G, as you guys pointed out. So going back to our patient, uh, we did serum immunofixation, and it turns out that she ended up having an IgG lambda monoclonal component. And this was fairly significant at 3.9. So um, just to um, review monoclonal gammopathies, you know, there's a lot of differences in the spectrum of diseases um, based on your immunoglobulin subtype. So there's IgG, IgM, IgA, and then the biclonal and light chain only that we talked about. Um, and the main concern is diseases like MGUS and myeloma, and then also Waldenstrom's uh, macroglobulinemia. So in terms of disease manifestations, the pathophysiology of MGUS to myeloma is actually accumulation of um, various mutations and genomic uh, rearrangements throughout the life cycle of a plasma cell. So uh, this can happen slowly or quite fast, depending on the types of mutation that you obtain. And then similarly, you can have a uh, progression to other things like IgM, MGUS, smoldering, uh, Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, and then all the way going to WM. How, so the next thing is uh, clinical manifesta manifestations. So I think all of us learned the CRAB mnemonic uh, back in med school, uh, which refers to hypercalcemia, renal impairment, anemia, and bony lesions. But, um, this is uh, true for kind of the classic um, IgG and multiple myeloma, multiple myeloma, but there's actually quite a diversity of symptoms associated with IgM, uh, MGUS, or WM, and that includes things like neuropathy, hyperviscosity, renal impairment, amyloidosis, cold agglutinin disease, and so I it's kind of beyond the scope of this talk to go through all of these, but just keep in mind that depending on the type of immunoglobulin, immunoglobulin that's involved in your disease, you can have different presentation of symptoms. So how do we diagnose uh, these diseases? So MGUS and smoldery MM are pretty easy. Um, basically, they're all defined by the absence of end organ damage associated with a plasma cell uh, process. MGUS is a less severe form of smoldering MM in which the quantity of uh, your M protein is low. And then on bone marrow, bone marrow biopsy, you have less than 10% involvement of plasma cells or clonal plasma cells. Whereas in smoldering MM, you can either have a lot of the M protein or you can have a polyclon, sorry, or you can have greater than 10% plasma cell uh, component 
but again, no an organ damage. For symptomatic MM, the uh, diagnostic criteria previously was uh, you have presence of crab, but actually there's been a change in the diagnostic criteria. So this is one of the key takeaways is that instead of just crab now, there's a couple of other criteria that can give you diagnosis of MM, and that is abbreviated as SLIM. So you can either have greater than 60% clonality of plasma cells on a bone marrow biopsy. You can have a white chain involved to uninvolved ratio of greater than 100. So remember going back to your serum immunofixation, it's the one that's expressed highly divided one that's by the one that's not. Or you can have an MRI scan that shows greater than one focal lesion. And then similarly for diagnosis of MGUS and smolder MM, it's basically absence of uh, the slim crab criteria. The S stands for 60%. So S, the S in 60, 60% uh, clonality in a plasma cell uh, bone marrow biopsy. So slim crab. One thing that one thing that I thought was interesting is that this criteria has two separate parts for bone bony involvement. So our classic criteria is osteolytic lesions or osteoclastic lesions on a bone marrow scan, either by X-ray or CT scan. Uh, but interestingly, they also include a new one where a focal lesion on seen on MRI uh, greater than five millimeters is sufficient for diagnosis of MM. And I thought this was kind of curious. It turns out that MRI has higher sensitivity in detecting early lesions, uh, early bone lesions uh, for MM. And it's pretty interesting because it goes to the underlying pathophysiology of MM. So, you know, typically when I think of MM, um, I think of plasma cells expressing immunoglobulins and the immunoglobulins cause disease, you know, wh whether that's um, uh, um, like renal impairment, anemia. Um, but actually, plasma cells have a lot of uh, interactions with the bone marrow. So MM cells can adhere to hematopoietic stem cells and also stromal cells in the bone marrow um, by direct cell-cell interactions through integrins and adhesion factors. And this notably activates NF-CAPB pathway that leads to increased osteoclastic activity. And so this is the underlying pathophysiology in which MM contributes, um, bone, contributes to bony lesions. It's actually in this tumor microenvironment that you have the amplification of different chromosomal abnormalities, development of new um, gene mutations that lead to progression of MM into like the extra medullary MM. And because this process is so important, um, I think that's why they included the new uh, criteria for MRI, uh, MRI uh, focal lesion. And the treatment of MM, you know, there's, uh, because this is so important, there's actually uh, uh, immunothera uh, uh, chemotherapy drugs that target, um, target these processes. So bortezomab uh, inactivate, inactivates NF-kappa B and um, kills off osteoclast in the bone marrow. Um, another name for this is, uh, I think it's Venclad. Um, and again, uh, we're trying to detect early onset intramedullary myeloma with this new slim crab criteria before you have further mutations that give rise to extramedullary myeloma. Okay, so going back to our patient now, um, we've identified that she had, a, she had a gamma gap, she had an IgG lambda monoclonal component, and just to remind you, these were her initial labs. She had that low sodium, the creatinine of 3.3, um, she had some FOS and uh, elevated bile. So what do you wanna do next for this patient? Nice, John. I, I was hoping that like a picture would help you guys remember the, the slim crab. 
Great, uh, everyone chose E. So in this patient, uh, we do want to consult hematology. I think the main concern is getting a bone marrow biopsy for workup of this patient. So we don't exactly, so even though this patient has creatinine abnormalities and if, even if they had anemia, we don't know if this is directly related to this IgG component. And we have to get a bone marrow biopsy to establish the fact that she has a clon uh, clonal process in her bone marrow. So in order for um, us to diagnose, diagnose MM, um, the, these like end organ damage or the myeloma defining uh, events, they have to be attributed to the underlying plasma cell proliferative, proliferative disorder. So a lot of times what you can have is you can have a monoclonal gammopathy and then independent end organ damage that is not associated with a plasma cell disorder. So that's why a bone marrow is uh, so critical for the diagnosis of MM. And we don't really want to defer to outpatient. We don't know, uh, or and we don't want to like just repeat labs in three months because uh, we want to diagnose her and treat her if she does have MM. All right. So um, the last couple of slides will just be focusing on um, MGUS. I think in the outpatient setting, a lot of the uh, uncertainty revolving MGUS and smoldering MM is how do we really monitor it. And I think this figure is uh, pretty cool. It de depicts the risk of production, uh, pr progression from various conditions to um, uh, you know, clinically relevant MM. So for MGUS, the risk of progression is roughly 1% per year to either smoldering myeloma or multiple myeloma. But once you have smoldering MM, and again, this, this is a disease where there's no end organ damage, but you can either have a lot of your monoclonal protein, or if you can have a lot of um, clonal plasma cells, the risk of pro uh, progression increases up to 10% per year. And so I found this um, flow sheet pretty helpful from up to date. Basically, when you have newly diagnosed MGUS, you want to repeat uh, early on within the first three to six months to look for red flags. And the things that you want to assess for are uh, worsening monoclonal protein component, worsening free light chain ratio, um, or new end organ damage. And then for clinical evaluation, you assess for things like lymphadenopathy, B symptoms, weight loss, um, things like that. If you have no red flags, and it's basically all of these low risk criteria, so your protein is less than 1.5, you have an IgG type, or if you have a normal serum uh, free, free light chain ratio, then your risk of progression is very, very low, um, uh, only like 5% in 20 years. And so for these patients, you actually don't really need to do anything for them. You can just clinically follow them in the outpatient setting with annual physical um, and history. And if there's really no change in their clinical status, you don't need to get labs for them. If they have one or more of these risk factors, so most notably, I think, is that they have an IgM monoclonal uh, gammopathy, then they have at least one point. And so for these patients, you want to do annual screening for them. So annual ESPA, free light chain ratio, uh, get some labs, and then screen them up until uh, age 80. So the key takeaway from this figure is that really the type of monoclonal gammopathy you have is pretty important if, you, if everything else is low risk. All right, so that's the end of the talk. The, just to summarize some teaching for all. So uh, hopefully by now that uh, you've recognized that the gamma gap is relatively important as a predictor of all cause mortality. Uh, gamma gap is calculated by protein minus uh, your albumin. It's abnormal, it's greater than four. And then the AG ratio is another way of looking at it. Globulins have a number of functions. It's not just immunoglobulins, uh, things like alpha, alpha one antitrypsin, haptoglobin all uh, contribute to your globulin um, distribution. Um, the SPEP can give you a lot of insights on various disease pathologies, not just uh, your monoclonal gammopathies. And then for the diagnosis, diagnosis of MM, uh, remember the scary uh, nightmare fuel uh, slim crab uh, mnemonic. And then for MGUS, if you're low risk, you don't really need to do anything. But if you have uh, one or more risk factors, then you want to do annual screening. Um, I think that's it. Uh, in terms of time, it looks like I have a couple of minutes for questions. So happy to answer any questions that you guys might have.
Can I ask a question? Um, yeah. Uh, just wanted to clarify that, did you say that, so if like all other things being equal, so it sounds like IgM, higher IgM related to IgG or other classes is worse prognostically, it sounds like, and is light chain also worse prognostically? Um, yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, that is true. So IgG is low risk. So anything that's not IgG uh, monoclonal gammopathy is higher risk. So if you have an IgM or an IgD or an IgE monoclonal gammopathy, you have at least one point. And so for those patients, you want to screen annually. Similarly, if you just have light chain only uh, monoclonal gammopathy, you should also screen annually. Adam, this was great. Thanks so much. Um, I have a quick question for you. If I have a patient who has slim crab signs and symptoms, but a normal um, protein cap, is that reassuring for us? Or would you send an SPEP regardless? Uh, normal uh, protein, sorry. Uh, so if you have slim crab, so I guess... It would be, so the slim crab, it'd be hard to have unless you have a bone marrow biopsy. And I, I'm trying to think, because, so are you saying if you have like uh, creatinine, uh, hypercalcemia, renal dysfunction, anemia without like a protein gap, would you send an SPEP? Is that kind yeah. of the question? And, the and, other kind of getting at, and kind of getting at what is the sensitivity of the, uh, the gamma gap initially? Yeah. So that's a great question. I don't know the specific numbers, but I think that without a protein gap, you would, it would be hard for you to have greater than like three grams per uh, deciliter of your M protein. Cause the, um, the gamma gap pretty much always comes from your globulin component, uh, right? Remember like 30% is your globulin component and then uh, the rest is um, your albumin. So if you don't have a gamma gap, I don't think it would be clinically significant. Um, I will look, I would look for other causes. Yeah. Unless there's severe albumin deficiency. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, it did. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Helen, when should you order UPEP? So I don't know anything about the kidney. So I, uh, purposely omitted the UPEP. Uh, I think so for UPEP, um, you want to order it. Uh, when you're looking for um, like urinary, uh, like renal dysfunction. So uh, happens a lot in AL amyloidosis and free light chain only gammopathies. Um, but yeah, Lily, if you want to chime in. <laughs> no, I, no, um, I think like um, when there's renal insufficiency, you should usually get a UPEP. Yeah, I think just a random is fine. Awesome. Well, and Adam, hopefully you're seeing the, the multitudes of praise in the chat, people calling you the <laughs> goat for demystifying protein gaps, which I assume they're mean the, the greatest of all time. <laughs> Perfection. Thanks, Thanks AJ. Fantastic. <laughs> Um, thank you so much, Adam. We're going to take a four minute break and we'll start back up at 1045 with the wonderful Dr. Jess Preet Bahia. <laughs> 